had already been sound asleep on this night that she called. I kept ignoring her incessant calls to try to avoid her drunken accusations. But on the third call, I rolled over reluctantly and looked at the time, which was a little past 2 AM. I answered the phone in an annoyed fog and heard only crying. I can't do this anymore. You don't love me. You'll never love me, she choked out through tears. I tried my best to reassure her once again that I loved her more than life itself. But she was set in her state of mind, and there was nothing that I could do or say to change that. When she suddenly ceased her crying and got quiet, I got nervous. Lorena, I questioned. Love. I could hear her making noise, but it seemed so far away that I thought that she had set down the phone and gone to grab something. I feared the worst, so I begged her to answer. If you love me, she began quietly and breathing heavily, you'll stay with me. I hope poison control gets here soon, she breathed. I began sobbing uncontrollably, and I screamed to the void in front of me, saying anything that I hoped would keep her from hurting herself. She whispered to me that she had taken pills and drank a bottle of Clorox, like it was a great secret that I had to keep. And I began trying to throw my fist through the darkness of my room to where I thought things like my bedpost or a wall should be. Please don't do this. We're going to get married, remember? I promise. I wasn't trying to keep quiet anymore. I didn't care who I woke up in the house with my banging around and frustrated groans. Please stay with me, my love. I can't do this without you. Don't leave me like this, I begged. But her incoherent responses grew quieter and slower. And soon all that I could hear was her slowed and almost inaudible breaths. I cried into the phone and clung to the seconds between her breaths. Then, from her end of the phone, I very faintly heard a doorbell ring followed by loud knocks. There were another couple louder knocks, and then a loud crash. I heard muffled voices, and I began screaming into the phone for help as someone on the other end of the line ended the call. I dropped down into my bed and grabbed my trusty razor, still in darkness. If she was hurting this much, then maybe so should I. I sat on my bed and blindly let the razor find its home in the warmth of my forearm. Tears poured from my eyes as blood escaped the open wound. I didn't bother to wipe either before I laid on the bed that we once shared. All that mattered to me before this phone call was keeping her at least vaguely happy while she was with me. A few days later, I received a call from the police asking a lot of questions because I was the last person that she had called when she tried to kill herself. Over the course of the week, I would get more calls from the hospital and people that I could only assume were her family and friends. Apparently, she had ruined her voice with the bleach that she swallowed and wouldn't be able to talk for weeks, so I was blindly blamed for her suicide attempt. I heard it so much that I began to believe it, until her grandparents called me the week after the attempt while I was at one of the baseball games that my family attended every Sunday instead of church. <sighs> I had to hide my anxiety from my parents as the phone rang in my hand. They had no idea what had happened only a few nights before. I excused myself and hid under a tree as I answered what I assumed was just another threatening call. We just want you to know, her grandmother began, that we are so grateful that she had you on the other end of the line. This was the first sympathetic voice that I had heard on this matter, and I tried my very best to cling tightly to her words. Mija, she continued, we just want you to understand that this isn't in any way 
your fault, okay? I couldn't understand why she enunciated certain words at the time. I was so overwhelmed and grateful that I couldn't even respond to this wonderful woman. She had told me exactly what I wanted to hear. I didn't want to believe that it was my fault. I tried my best to choke out a genuine apology, and I heard her crying with me on the other end of the line. I guess Lorena was a little foggy on the events of that night because she also began to blame me for her choice to attempt to end her life later that week. My friends always told me that you were bad for me, and I didn't believe them until now, she began. Maybe it's better if you don't talk to me for a while. No amount of pleading and bargaining from me could sway her decision. It devastated me that this girl that I dedicated all of my love to could stop talking to me after such a horrific event. About a year had gone by that she kept me far enough away that she could believe that I didn't care anymore. But one day as I was exiting one of my third year Filipino classes, I saw her just a few feet from my classroom in front of the library, standing in the center of a crowd like a celebrity back from the dead. As I began to close the gap between us, I studied her. She was smiling and talking to her adoring fans, but her hair, which was once jet black, was now stained with bright red streaks. Her plaid pants that she had told me were once a few sizes too small now looked to be a few sizes too big. Her knee-high Doc Martens seemed clunky and were carelessly left unlaced. Her complexion, which was once a warm brown, was now a sickly gray. I tried to hug her when I reached her, but she shrugged me off with an annoyed face and a one-sided shoulder cringe. I stood next to her, waiting for my turn to swoon over the celebrity. And as I stood there, I also began to notice that her eyes seemingly floated in her darkened eye sockets. She chewed at her bleeding lip and scratched at a scab on her arm. I couldn't shake these things away. She was no longer the beautiful, lively girl who took my breath away the day that we met about three years before that call. This girl had shown up on my doorstep with a friend of mine. She had knocked on the heavy wooden door and asked my overprotective parents if I was home. They wouldn't let me out of the house, and no one was allowed in. So we stood, stationary, with me under the doorframe and her only inches from my face on the red brick steps. I studied her inquisitively as her dark brown eyes studied me right back. She had waist length black hair pulled back into a ponytail with a fringe that was barely visible from under the front of her hat. She had these dimples that would peek out and flirt with me as she smiled. Lorena, she said was her name, and it sounded like a poem to me in itself. She definitely intrigued me upon our first encounter, and we became instant friends. I began to brush off my parents and their rules, and I would stay out a little later at school, walk home a little slower with her by my side, and eventually, I even brought her into my house to download the industrial music that I was into at the time and watch horror movies that became big during the time, like Saw and Paranormal Activity. I adored her <laughs> and wanted to spend every second of the day with her. The more that we began to hang out together, the more evident it became that we were both broken beyond repair. She would lay down on my tiny cheetah print covered futon beneath a shelf of voyeur stuffed animals and I would lay beside her with my legs twined with hers and trace her face with my fingertips as she would confide in me. Through whispers and tears, 
She would tell me that she had been abandoned by her parents and raped in her youth. And I had told her that I had been abandoned by the women in my life, like my so-called mother and grandmother, who had sworn to stand with me and protect me from the abuse that I had suffered in my childhood at the hands of the men that called themselves my father and stepfather. We found solace in the fact that we were both running from our pasts and we clung to each other for support. Unfortunately, neither of us was strong enough to even hold our own heads above the sea of depression and we both fell victim to self-medicating. It seemed like we were two sides of the same coin, minted by betrayal and pain, and the only difference between the two of us was our method of mutilation. I was a cutter, and she was a drunken drug addict. She liked the hard stuff like meth and coke, while I couldn't bring myself to do anything but punch mirrors until they broke and dig razors into my skin. I recall that neither of us liked to be touched, yet we desperately needed the comfort. I imagine the times that we would lie together and how our bodies had begun to think as one. Our breaths began to synthesize every time our bodies met, and our body temperatures would even out every time our skin touched, and our laughs would even erupt simultaneously after we would share our little inside jokes. I remembered how we fell deeper in love every day that she came to my house after school. My parents would let her in and were content in naively thinking that I had finally found a friend that wasn't a boy. I would trace my fingers along every inch of her body and breathe her into my lungs without my parents being any the wiser just on the other side of the wall. With all the time that we spent exploring each other's bodies, I began to learn that there were some places that I couldn't touch because she would cry if I would touch her face, she would wince if I tried to hug her from behind, and kissing her neck brought out definite feelings of aggression. But even so, I was hurting. I felt a heaviness in my chest when my parents would make her leave at 9 p.m. on the dot every night. And I began to fool myself into thinking that if I could focus all of my energy into helping her heal, that maybe in the process, I would heal too. I had been struggling for years as a victim of self-harm and trying not only to cope but grow past my pain without any help or knowledge of how to do so. I would still flinch if anyone walked by my bedroom door as flashbacks of my father barging in to beat me would emerge. I would have panic attacks if I thought too long about my family, and I was hiding the severity of my disassociation from reality and my addiction to cutting from Lorena so that I could try to help her achieve what I could not in terms of learning to love love herself. I couldn't bear to see her experiencing the feelings of self-loathing that plagued me on a daily basis. I knew how defeated I felt every day as I looked in the mirror and heard my father's voice telling me that I was lower than dirt. I wanted nothing more than to help her fight her demons so that I could see her beautiful smile that never failed to warm my heart for even a moment. I used to place my thumbs in her dimples every time she smiled and let the rest of my fingers hold her face. And when I saw that she was getting too down on herself, I would kiss her cheeks and tell her that my thumbs didn't have a home if she didn't smile. It never failed to get a giggle out of her every time. However, fighting with Lorena during my junior year of high school when she had come back to her adoring fans had pushed me to the extremes of self-mutilation. I would take razors to school and excuse myself to the bathroom whenever thoughts of her would send me into a panic. But after her suicide attempt and seeing what she had become during our time apart, I began to realize that I hadn't really been grasping the gravity of my own situation. I missed a lot of my classes junior year due to sleeping in because I just couldn't face reality anymore. There was one day that I was making my way to the bathroom 
during a class that I didn't even attend enough to remember. My head hung down to hide my tears, my fingertips touching each other in anticipation as my feet carried me forward. I closed the door to the last stall, dropped my yellow backpack on the corner of the floor where the door met the wall, and took my place on the porcelain throne as I pulled my razor out of a makeup compact hidden in the small front pocket of my backpack. I looked at my scarred left arm and my scabbed right arm and ran my fingertips over the scabs, remembering the stories behind each one. My tears stopped, and I looked at the razor in my left hand. I took one deep breath, and I shook the urge to cut from my head. I wiped my tears and stood from my throne. I pulled my backpack from its comfy spot and put the razor back in its hiding place. I didn't want to feel this way anymore. I didn't want to feel the heaviness in my chest and the pain from my wounds that I tried to conceal. I realized that I wanted to feel something good for a change. And that started with being able to feel proud of myself for something. I walked out of the stall with my head held high, never to return. I'm not sure that I've ever really felt loved in my life. But I began to understand that I have to learn to feel love for myself before I can try to convince someone else that I know what love feels like. I don't know where Lorena is anymore, but I know that I've got a future that I began to build for myself, and I take pride in knowing that I will always be there looking out for my own best interest. Thank you, Desiree Della O.